Thanks so much for joining us today, Superintendent. Um, you know, right off the bat, I want to acknowledge there are just so many issues in education right now, and we're not going to be able to get to all of them in the discussion today. But I do want to talk to you about substitute teacher and staff shortages across the state. What are you hearing from districts? Well, you know, everybody is really being hit by the substitute shortage, and it's not just teachers, it's paraeducators, those folks in the classroom who uh, help maybe during math workshop or help during reading intervention time. Uh, it could be those folks that you see out on the playground that help keep kids safe. It's your cafeteria workers, uh, it's all those folks, it's your bus drivers. So they're seeing shortages across the board, and. Um, they're also trying to find some creative ways to plug those holes, but it has really um, been difficult for districts. Um, and it depends on, uh, you know, if they're having a high virus transmission in that district too, how many teachers are out that day, maybe they're having a low, maybe it's a district that has a, a low virus transmission, but everybody is seeing uh, the substitute teacher shortage and the, the paraeducator shortage affect them in different ways. Are there any areas of the state where those shortages are especially acute? Um, I think, like I said, it depends on uh, if they're seeing a high virus transmission or if they um, are not. And so I think that really uh, makes a difference in uh, who, who's being affected at one time. So it just depends. I know the state has really tried to encourage state employees to take advantage of incentives to act as substitute teachers. Um, are we seeing that make an impact and is that mostly in the Treasure Valley? Uh, it's really too early to tell uh, because that money was not appropriated until October um, and districts can draw down the reimbursements twice a month, they can do it once a month, they can do it at the end when the deadline is up, which is December 15th. So it's really too early to tell uh, the impact on those funds. The other thing is, uh, you know, um, there's some roadblocks behind just giving the money. So the money was great, and I applaud Governor Little for doing that for education, but the things that districts are facing are, um, you know, it, it's you still have to be fingerprinted. You still have to pass a background check, and then you have to be trained. And so when you're fingerprinted and, pa and passing a background check, and by all means do I want to see everybody who's gonna be involved with our kids, uh, background checked and fingerprinted. Um, that's, I, I wanna make that clear, but that's a process that takes a while. So when the money was appropriated in October, then you have several more weeks for those people who volunteered to get fingerprinted and pass a background check, and then they have to train. Uh, so there was a very short turnaround time there for districts to access that money, but it absolutely has uh, been very helpful and it's too early to tell. Uh, how much has been accessed because of all those different ways it can be um, spent and because uh, of the fact that districts are still working through training some of those folks who have stepped up to the plate. Now, I stepped out to substitute teach as well as several members of my staff uh, who have stepped out to substitute teach as well, but I know some of the other agencies have had a conversation with me. Uh, Governor Little did have a program uh, where um, state employees could also earn vacation days if they stepped up to the plate as part of the public to help fill those gaps in the substitute teacher shortage that we're seeing. But other state agencies are experiencing what even my agency and what the education field is, is feeling right now, and that's just a worker shortage in general. And the education field has not been immune from that. So other state agencies are saying, you know, I'd love to help, but I don't have the people either. So uh, it has been helpful, but it's too early to tell uh, how much of that uh, money and, and how much of that will be used by the, sep the December 15th deadline. Let's talk about the impacts on students. Has this resulted in uh, school districts shutting down for a little bit because they can't find people to come teach? How is it affecting their education? Sure it has, yeah. So we've had um, some districts close because they couldn't find bus drivers or they didn't have enough uh, substitutes for the day. Um, I don't know if you've heard, I have a student advisory council and you know we have representatives and students from all over the state. and. I met with them um, a few months ago and I'm about to meet with them again on Monday. And I thought that they would really be interested in all things COVID. And, and while they talked about it a little bit, that wasn't their top priority. Uh, but one of the things they did mention is the substitute uh, teacher shortage and how it's been affecting them. And they said, a few of them gave me their examples and how it's affecting um, their peers. And so 
you know, if you have thir three third grade um, teachers and one of them is out, they will split that class up and they will give half to one teacher and half to the other teacher temporarily until their teacher comes back. So that was one example they shared with me. The other example uh, that's, that's been, um, you know, really getting down to the student level is tra the transportation shortage of bus drivers. So you might have um, buses picking students up in shifts, and I've heard that too. So, you know, kids are standing around longer at the end of the day, uh, waiting for their shift to get picked up to be taken home. Um, again, I, I, um, I understand why the governor gave money to education to help fill those gaps, and, and I applaud him. And, and I also wrote a letter to the governor to make sure um, that um, he understood I wanted to ask for bonuses for our teachers and his uh, federal coronavirus relief funds, and I asked for $1,000 for each teacher to help boost and incentivize uh, for their efforts um, through this pandemic. So. Uh, it has been, uh, you know, affecting our students, um, and I do know that folks are doing everything they can uh, to help, uh, you know, plug that gap. Yeah, and, and we've heard so much about teacher pay, and for good reason, but, you know, schools can't operate with this without the support staff that you mentioned, and I'm thinking, of course, of the kitchen staff and the bus drivers and custodians. Um, you know, some wages are very low, you know, uh, for for substitute teachers, a lot of districts, they're in the 11 to $12 range for a certified teacher. So how much discussion is there about raising pay for the support staff and the substitutes for them as well? There's been a lot of discussion around that. Um, and that's why you will see in my uh, upcoming budget request, uh, that we improve uh, the amount of money that the state gives for districts to pay for their paraeducators. Um, that's why you will also see the ask in there for uh, something that we educators call the career ladder, uh, which is making sure that we um, keep that alive and well. That is, uh, to the general public, that just means scheduled raises for our teachers. You'll see both of those in my budget ask. That's why the governor gave that $10 million to help um, you know, raise the pay for substitutes and for paraeducators, and I encourage districts to use that money for that reason. Um, so it's going to take a variety of, um, you know, out of the box thinking ideas to really uh, address this issue. But there are some things that we are doing to help improve pay for educators and for paraeducators. Like I said, I did uh, write the governor a letter asking him for, you know, um, bonuses for teachers as well. So we want to keep those good folks in the classroom and reward them. Uh, like you said, our paraeducators like our bus drivers, our support staff, our cafeteria workers. Um, school districts are competing with places like Amazon and McDonald's who can pay them more. And so we, we have to work to make sure that we are offering a fair wage to those folks so they'll wanna stay in the classroom uh, and help our students achieve. Right, a lot of those private businesses that you mentioned start at at least fifteen dollars an right. hour for entry level positions. You know, and, and if a substitute teacher is making eleven dollars an hour, you know, ninety-five dollars a day in a lot of these districts, is that career ladder and are those pay raises that you've proposed, is that gonna be enough to address that gap in pay? Well, that's why the governor gave, like I said, the 10 million for districts to use for, um, you know, making sure they can offer more to those folks who step up to the plate and help substitute whatever position that might be. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a person who's certified. Like I said, it can be a cafeteria worker, it can be a bus driver. So offering them a little bit more. And then the career ladder, what I've heard from educators, uh, is it's a step in the right direction, that they can see that their raises are scheduled and what they're going to get. And so um, they are supportive of the career ladder, and um, I know that, that we the career ladder is something that educators want to keep in place. You know, I, I also want to ask you about Idaho being on track to have a $1.6 billion surplus. Uh, you submitted your fiscal year 2023 budget request a couple months ago now. Uh, when it comes to education, what would you like to see that money being spent on, and has that changed now that you know how much more money Idaho has than we initially anticipated? I want that money spent on all of my the priorities for education, uh, but I know uh, realistically I have to share the checkbook uh, with the you know the family checkbook with the entire state of Idaho but I, I did have some pretty big asks in there this time and one of them uh, is all day 
optional kindergarten, which is $39 million. Um, and optional because some districts might already be doing it. Um, and uh, optional because maybe some parent doesn't want to take advantage of that. And, and I've also heard from administrators, you know, principals and superintendents that they don't have the room, um, you know, this to have all day kindergarten. So um, it's for at risk students uh, and it's a start. Um, I think it's a, a great way to see how many people are gonna take advantage of it, um, to see what parents are interested in it and um, at-risk students, because as a former third grade teacher, when a, when a child got to me in third grade and they had a learning gap, I knew by then the chances of closing that learning gap were slim to none. And so we are seeing our kindergarten students come in with a gap already. Uh, so we wanna get those kids early uh, before they get to third grade. So again, that's why we're at, offering it to our at-risk students and it's optional. The other thing we want is parents to be involved. I've heard from legislators loud and clear uh, that they want a parental involvement piece in, in this all day kindergarten ask. So I will be working closely with the legislature uh, on, on that piece for legislation. The other thing that um, you will see uh, in my budget ask because of the surplus is the Advanced Opportunities Program. Now for those people watching, that is just kids earning credits while they're still in high school towards college. One of the things that my Student Advisory Council was interested in when we met was making sure that Advanced Opportunities stayed in place because they understood that that's one of the ways where students feel successful. It engages their peers. It's an opportunity to see uh, if they are um, ready for college classes. Uh, and it's an opportunity for um, students to reach for the stars. We often talk about during this pandemic learning loss, uh, but how are we challenging kids, those kids who are ready to go on? Well, advanced opportunities is one of those ways that we can do that. So uh, reading uh, literacy is very important to me. As a former third grade teacher, you will see uh, a, a continued ask for funding in the budget for that. Um, my team has been working very hard on this next topic, which is dyslexia. And that's one of the things that my student advisory council was one of their priorities. I really thought it was gonna be COVID, uh, but it was dyslexia. So they said, uh, Superintendent Ibarra, if we really wanna close the reading gap in Idaho, we really need to help our peers who are struggling with underlying conditions like dyslexia. They said a lot of their peers or even their siblings have dyslexia. And so uh, my department has been working on a handbook and um, that's why we adopted the new Idaho reading indicator four years ago because it has a piece in there that can actually help teachers um, uh, find out if a kid is struggling with dyslexia. So uh, you might see some legislation come out of my department this year around dyslexia as well. Um, so those are some of the top priorities. Uh, and, and of course, closing that gap for our uh, paraeducators and the difference between what the state gives the district and what the district can pay. Uh, you will see us work on improving that pay for our paraeducators as well. I, I um, really am excited that we have a surplus and being that education has been a lot of the legislators uh, focus as well as the governors. Uh, I'm excited about going into this session and seeing what we can do for education as a team. I do want to expand on your full day kindergarten proposal. There is a lot of appetite among lawmakers and it seems the governor's office to have full day kindergarten be an option for all students, not just the at risk students um, in your proposal. So when you have the money and you have the excitement building behind this idea of full day kindergarten, why not go for the whole thing? Why? Why just a small piece? Well, it's a start. Um, and you have to be realistic when you're going into the legislative session. Like I said earlier, we have to share the family checkbook with everybody. And there are still some other big asks within my budget, like the career ladder, that's the increasing salaries for teachers, advanced opportunities. And so um, this 39 million is, is simply an ask. Uh, we looked at offering that to all students and that that's approximately 60 million if everyone was to take advantage of it. Uh, but we will likely get there someday. This is just the beginning of what we wanna do for our students. Do you anticipate critical race theory and social emotional learning being an undercurrent under all of these conversations about public education again this legislative session? Yes, I do, and I've seen it already. Um, you know, what I've told parents about critical race theory is, is uh, it's simply uh, parental involvement. You know, while schools were closed, 
uh, parents were looking over the shoulders of their students and some of them didn't like what they saw. And so, you know, critical race theory is very hard to define, but a lot of parents around the state are, are frightened. Um, How would you define it? Um, you know, I really don't have a definition either. It's just, it's a philosophy. It's something at the, um, usually at the higher education level uh, that is, um, talked about. It's usually not in the K through 12 classroom. I won't say that it's it's never happened because there's examples out there, uh, but it's something that parents are concerned about. So districts really, and I'm always going to advocate for parental involvement. Um, the research is very clear that um, parental involvement is the number one determination for student success. And so we want parents involved, no matter how spirited those debates might get and what somebody's definition of critical race theory is, we need to have those hard conversations and we need parents at the table. You say that there have been examples. Are there examples here in Idaho that you know about in the K through 12 system? I think parents have their idea and their examples that they're uncomfortable with and that's why they need to have a conversation with their local school district. Um, I did have some parents show me a couple of examples one time. Um, it's really a vocabulary word here and there is the examples that I saw that make them uncomfortable and I think having a conversation with their school district about uh, you know what makes them uncomfortable and why and how they can work through that uh, is is the best approach uh, to that moving forward. Um, but I have not seen any examples of Idaho in any of the, the um, examples that are kind of being passed out across the nation. There was a study um, in Hillsdale College that was published um, about critical race theory and it gave pretty um, some pretty explicit examples from different states and I didn't see Idaho in there. Um, you know, I skimmed over the article, I didn't see Idaho in there, and I've not seen Idaho in any of the other examples um, that are pretty hair-raising, you know, that would make a parent um, worry. And I also want to tell parents that I've been getting out into classrooms and um, touring the state, you've probably seen that, and then the thing that I've been doing is visiting government classes and history classes. And I will ask the teacher, do you know why I'm here? And, and they will say, yes, I'm, I'm happy to have you, watch my whole lesson, and, and they've been surprises. They haven't been pre-planned, a lot of them. So, um, you know, the teacher, uh, they're so cute. It's so great to have the superintendent here, but it's also nerve-wracking, right? Uh, but the things that I saw was the Constitution being taught, the Declaration of Independence, um, and teachers saying to their students, um, if you have questions about anything, if you want to challenge anything, please do so. Um, and I have not seen uh, critical race theory being taught, but there are parents who are uncomfortable with it and have questions. I encourage them to talk to their local school board. Are you worried that these conversations are undermining trust in the public education system, especially as you're getting ready for some big asks from the legislature? Um, I do. I think it it uh, it does um, tie into the trust factor again. That's why we want we educators know we have talked about this for years that the research is super clear that parental involvement is the number one determination for student success. We want you at the table and I am always gonna be an advocate for that. And um, yeah, it's about building trust and making sure that parents feel like they have a voice and that they can be at the table uh, and they can express their views. We're just about out of time, but as you have toured the state, are you happy with what you're seeing in the schools and in the classrooms? Of course, I, what I'm seeing in the schools and the classrooms is enthusiastic, happy teachers, glad to be there with their kids. The kids are enthusiastic, happy to be back in school. Um, so yes, I am pleased with what I'm seeing around the state. And I do wanna give a shout out to all of Idaho educators uh, for their hard work because we have been consistently ranked as um, low achieving uh, in the state of Idaho and um, especially by um, Ed Week, they have ranked us in the past as 30, 31st for achievement and recently our ranking came out and it was 17th. Um, that's a huge jump and that's a credit to our teachers around the state. So huge congratulations to them and I want them to know I wanna be around when you make top 10. Do you imagine that's something that's gonna come up on the campaign trail? Uh, well, we'll see, right? <laughs> Superintendent Sherry Ibarra, thank you so much for your time. It was my pleasure, thank you for having me.